We have a distinct attitude. It determines our thinking. It is the driving force which compels us to continually develop new visions. Beginning with the finest materials, traditional methods, and the most innovative technologies. In collaboration with the world's best designers. Resulting in cutting edge products. Our attitude reveals itself in every detail. Perfect in form and in function. In a class of their own. We share this attitude with our discerning customers. For them, we make no compromise. In every one of our avant-garde products. In every version. In every customization. In perfection. Form follows perfection. Oxor. Hi everyone, welcome to the AD Weekender. I'm Komal from AD and I hope you're enjoying what we've put together for you so far. For today's session, uh, we have some very accomplished and might I fun people uh, joining us. Um, let's get straight to it. I'll quickly introduce you to everyone here and we can get to uh, the conversation. First off, let me introduce you to Iram. Uh, Iram Sultan is a favorite at AD. Uh, she's an AD100 designer. She founded the Iram Sultan Design Studio and has been practicing for over 20 years. Uh, her design language, um, at least to me, is, uh, is sort of situated very happily. In, uh, uh, on one hand, it's this clean, crisp modernity, and on the other, there are these glimpses of tradition. Um, it's, a, it's a fine mix of, of beauty, of comfort, of, of function, of course. And uh, in the few conversations that I've had with Iram, I've, um, I've learned of her, her love for storytelling. And that could be through art, through design, through literature, through music, uh, any any of that. That's that's theorem for you. Um, let me next get to uh, Ankur. Ankur Khosla is also an AD100 designer. Uh, she has her own bespoke design studio in Bombay. And her work ranges from um, private homes and bungalows to, to hospitality and wellness projects. Uh, in fact, I found that Ankur, uh, she's very receptive to, um, to energies and vibes and sort of the sensorial aspects of, of design, of how to, how to you know, create memories uh, in, in interiors. In fact, at AD, we wrote about one of her um, restoration and interior design projects, uh, this apartment in... Uh, uh, Sunshine Towers, which is this beautiful, stunning Art Deco building in Oval Medan in Bombay. Um, ne next, let me uh, go to Martin Kosla. Martin has been practicing for uh, over 20 years as founding partner at Romy Kosla Design Studio in Delhi. His practice ranges in scale from these uh, smaller sort of environmentally conscious uh, buildings to these large corporate residential um, uh, institutional architecture and interiors. Uh, and also, um, as some of you might know, Martin has a parallel art practice. Uh, we saw uh, some very sculptural, intriguing works last year at Nature Mort and again at India Art Fair early this year. Finally, let me go over to Gaurav. Gaurav Malhotra, our final speaker for this session, is uh, he's managing director at Hans Kroyer India and Global Projects Asia. Um, the Hans Kroe Group, uh, which is the parent company of Axor, uh, it goes back to 1901, uh, and Axor was founded in 1993. Um, as you saw in the film earlier on, uh, Axor has um, a very, you know, it, it focuses on sort of uh, these unique uh, 
luxurious bath and kitchen spaces and over the years uh, it has collaborated with some of the finest international designers including uh, philip stark um, phoenix design and more uh, luxury and innovation are are two words that are very ingrained in the axor philosophy and which is precisely why uh, that is the the subject of our conversation today um as for gorov uh, you know in just personally his last few years at hans kroyer he's he's sort of put a lot of emphasis on improving the brand's visibility uh, credibility among partners and engaging more with the architect and design community which is why i think this session is also a tiny part of that um okay let me get to the subject of our conversation for the day uh, design now uh, the changing idea of luxury and innovation in a post covid world uh, it sounds uh, it's a fairly heavy subject uh, but to me you know we're essentially talking about two things uh, timeless uh, you know this idea of a luxury on one hand which is a very timeless idea and on the other hand uh, innovation which is sort of a constantly moving uh, target so we'll discuss uh, you know between those two extremes um okay with that uh, finally my monologue is over thankfully and we can move on to hearing from these oh, wonderful people who we've invited uh i just before we open session i just want to quickly throw it out there that i will sort of ask each of you a bunch of questions but you know at any point uh, if anybody has anything to add please do jump in um iram can i start with you um uh i want to you know i wanted to ask you uh, things very quickly become jargon like you know words like post covid and new normal like no matter what webinar we log into these days there are a bunch of terms like that floating around but i want to know from you like personally um has this sort of time that we're living through has it given you a sense of pause and have you in your own practice uh, reconsidered ideas of of luxury and innovation and what those might mean hi komal hi gorav martin and ankur thank you ad and greg thank you all of you for having me here um i think this has been an interesting time and i think the most interesting part of your question is the use of the term jargon i think jargon flies around a lot but i don't think it's here to stay um timelessness like you said has always been associated with luxury luxury is timeless and is not going anywhere i'm going to just bring darwinism into play for a minute here because i think evolution is the ball game that all of us need to play timelessness does not mean a lack of evolution luxury has been evolving for for a while now i think it's moved from this association with a commercial term to rather becoming associ uh, associated with more of an emotional being i think this pause that covid has given us has brought to forth the fact that our association of luxury is now with the security with well being with what it means to us i think that's luxury time uh, has always been associated with luxury and that's the luxury that covid gave us ironically um ankur stable internet is a luxury today right ankur um but you know there are many little aspects that this particular pandemic has brought into play but if you ask me that is it changing the definition of luxury completely i don't think so i think um luxury is evolving and has been doing so in various ways where we are today is perhaps a greater deeper meaning of the word luxury and how it applies to design from a purely commercial understanding um luxury for me for example has always been associated with historicity or uh, a sense of continuity i don't think that changes am i going to stop looking at antiques am i going to stop looking at some wonderful art like martens art which i love um will that take away from the notion of luxury no not at all i think the notion has just grown wider in its meaning the interesting question is um for us in this time the pause that we've taken is familiarity the new luxury or is it the older version of luxury which was okay i want something new every client had um, a request that they wanted something different or new is familiarity 
going to be the new definition that will merge with that. I think that is what we've been evolving in our practice as well, because we've been getting those sort of feedback from the clients that we are working with. Um, the other thing that this has given us time to look at, perhaps, is that while we look at what is familiar with for us, what is it that we can look at which has been there but ignored so far? Um, craft, for example, that we haven't looked at has seen a great resurgence in this time. There are a lot of people working on it because of the luxury of time. So all of that ties into design and into, I think, our various practices. In terms of innovation, I mean, I, I think I know Ankur and I have had these conversations separately about how she looks at it. Um, with our practice, I think innovation is linked to functionality. It has always been linked to functionality. And that has guided um, the entire approach. I don't think there's any difference today. For example, now in projects, in larger projects, we're looking at the addition of a mudroom sort of space which was never needed. Now you need it because you're going to disinfect, you're going to keep things away, you're going to need that space. Every space now needs a separate working area. We've all discovered the need for that in our time. So I think that's where we are in, you know, in this current time. But I think it's an interesting journey and there is no full stop and there's no current jargon that's defining anything for us. That's interesting. The idea that we need, uh, you know, a working corner or a working area everywhere we are. Since we've been at home for almost like six, seven months now. Uh, it, it actually leads to my next question. You know, um, while we are in a pandemic and it's uh, going through one and it's uh, a very grim situation, but we at AD over the last few months found that at AD we're, we're all about the home. And we found that maybe there is a new sort of love and interest in the home space like you know people are people falling in love with their bedrooms and their living rooms and even even their bath spaces um, people are redecorating again so uh, I, I want to ask you to elaborate a little bit on that as well that is there a sort of newfound love for for interiors and for even the idea of uh, domesticity so home is the greatest luxury today right? I mean, the space of a home is the greatest luxury, which is why we also see the same investment that people are making into their personal spaces. Um, to segue back a little bit into your prior question, the use of those spaces is what is changing, as you, you know, as we spoke about earlier. But the emphasis on home now is far greater, um, because we are spending so much time. So the two uh, essentials that we always needed to define luxury as, which was space and time, have now got solidified into one aspect of a home. You're cooking from your spaces. You are entertaining virtually like this from your spaces. Um, everything is happening from singular spaces. And they not only need to function, but give you a sense of well-being, which is why um, what they look like, how they feel, is becoming very important. Homes are, I think, far more emotional today than they were even earlier. Homes were always extremely intimate spaces. All our relationships were extremely intimate with clients whose homes we worked on. You had to understand how they lived, how they functioned. Today, it is far deeper than it has ever been. And I think um, it's easy to understand for everybody because we're all in the same boat or rather on the same sea in different boats. Um, we all are grappling with the same um, emotions and feelings. And I think, strangely enough, however virulent in this pandemic is, it is a unifying force in that sense. And I think design is um, picking up steam. I think luxury is picking up steam. They're not going anywhere. I think, you know, this association of emotions is driving us forward and hoping to take us to different spaces. Super. Um, the association with emotion. All right. Uh, Marzan, can I come to you next? Uh, thanks, Iram, by the way. Um, uh, Martin, Martin, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, there's always something very sort of authentic and and site specific, if I may say, about your about your work. Uh, is there a sort of strain uh, of luxury in that to use 
a local stone or to to reference a, a local aesthetic or pattern and in in that sense what what does luxury mean for you um so thanks thanks for having having me on the panel first of all and uh, hello everyone um um so i think what what our search here in the studio is very much centered around is to try and find the contemporary within the local so i think that has been been very central to to my practice and whether it whether we're building in goa or whether we're building in the mountains or we're, whether we're building in delhi i think the trueness of material is something that we really believe in bringing out uh and also not really trying to find these differentiations between the architecture and the interiors we don't like to see interiors as a you know as a completely new skin inside buildings nor the architecture as like an envelope for uh, a series of events to happen so having said that then how do we sort of push the idea of design and architecture forward how do we challenge existing uh forms of working existing uh as existing typologies of space and i think in that sense we try and bring in engineering in but we also then push local craft local material but really very much driven by a modernist agenda which is my own personal thing and it's not that we don't as a practice we're not searching for the craft within our practice in as a narrative aspect of building we're looking for the craft and the materiality as a uh defining criteria of the architecture i don't i don't know if if that sort of uh i'm i'm being clear enough here but i think uh what we like to see are, is that the space typology is actually very contemporary so we really try and open up spaces we try and move away from that but while we really try and keep the materiality very very local so we usually try and see if we can manage within a 5 or 10 km radius for most things and usually except for cement and steel you can manage to do a lot of things that are pretty much local so yes i think that then moving on from there to your question about luxury yes i think that for me luxury is an abundance of things that you have the least of and uh, our approach to luxury in that sense is a little less uh, about materials and objects but much more about the idea of space and time so are we really actually creating a large amount of space and are we encouraging people to want to sort of take a pause and spend time there and you know i i think that really becomes a sense of luxury um which stems from my own understanding of what luxury would for me would mean so you know i would love to be in a space that has a lot of local material has a grand view we have a bunch of lovely books to read and maybe not too much else you know and and uh, and silence um particularly for from someone with two young kids i think that would be ultimate luxury you know <laughs> for for me so i think yes i mean luxury is there but um, but also i mean architecture is about we are designing for others so you know we try and bring our aspects into the design but we then try and see how uh, who the end end users are whether it's residential or whether it's an office space how do we sort of bring these aspects into the design right now i want to add even with those of us who don't have kids that sounds like the perfect luxurious space to be in um i have one more i actually stalked your instagram a bit and found this project called uh, the b36 house and i saw a bunch of drawings do you do you want to tell us a little about that and and specifically if there were any ideas of sort of luxury and innovation that surfaced on on that drawing board um that that's actually a really interesting house we we really like it a lot uh particularly because uh the the client's daughter is a architecture graduate from Denmark so what that has done is that the conversation on architecture just you don't always have sort of very architectural conversations in terms of referencing historical architecture with clients because obviously it's a, it's a specific domain so there we've had this very interesting possibility so it's a client for whom we'd already done a house in delhi uh, and then this this house is in is in indore uh, and it's a large house and what's been really interesting about it is that we're designing the entire house the inside of the house is using all the materials that the outside of the house is using so we're actually taking uh local sort of local brick that moves from the outside to the inside which the 
and becomes actually the flooring and the walls. And we're using the stones uh, that are available. Well, in this case, coming in from Rajasthan because I, we were unable to find it. But the cladding of the building is also the interior, in, interior aspect of it. So I think that's been a really interesting aspect to the design because we've never had uh, a client who's been supportive and also challenging us to actually, uh, you know, push our own sense of the barriers and what, what essentially happens. So we're really, so the construction on that started literally just as COVID started. So it's been a bit slow, but we, we expect to see it kind of completed uh, within the next couple of years. Uh, yeah, I suppose a yeah, year and a half, two years. Uh, it's a large, it's a large project. Um, so we're really doing exactly what we talked about earlier, but we're really pushing it to the extreme. So I'm very keen to, to see what emerges and also to share it all with, with, with all of you to see eventually how we kind of did on that. But I, I'm really seeing a completely new material palette and new spatial typologies emerging out of that. So looking forward to that. Good luck with that one. Uh, thanks, Martha. And uh, Ankur, I'm going to come to you next. Um, I, you remember when we met for to discuss your the AD story about Sunshine Towers? I I I thought it was so clever what you said about uh, how you were interconnecting spaces and rooms, and uh, that even as Iram mentioned earlier, you know how we move through a space has sort of become very relevant, or how we use space itself has become sort of very relevant again. Um, you know, kids are doing their homework on kitchen counters and. I think like people are, you know, using their bath space maybe to escape the, the crazy family sometimes. Um, but tell me a little more about that, about, about the concept of how we use space. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, AD India. And a warm hug to all my participants and all the team members who have helped organize this beautiful panel discussion. Uh, so coming to... Komal, what you said, and um, uh, these being extremely uh, interesting times where we have seen domestic, um, the domestic environment literally being st stretched like an elastic band in terms of functions and activities for the various family members. And um, I think, you know, it's, um, it's an interesting time for having redefinitions of the names of spaces. Uh, we have inherited names like toilet, bathroom, bedroom, um, you know, almost like hand-me-downs over a period of time. And, um, you know, in some of the uh, cities, which are other than the metros, they even use this word called drawing room, which, um, you know, it's a very interesting, uh, it's an abbreviation from the word withdrawing room. So um, I feel that these were all names given based on the activities and the functions of that period of time. And at that given genre, it was extended domestic use and uh, uh, time spent a lot on entertainment within the space. So, um, Given that you mentioned right now in the COVID times, I think we have kind of experienced something from the past. And um, I, like you mentioned, Komal, you know, I like to refer to the past and learn from it. And um, what is it that we need to imbibe, but also innovate from it is something that I look at it. And um, like we see the, uh, uh, you know, the modern day life is full of uh, multi multitasking, it's multidimensional. Uh, we have a new set of tool sets to work with. So I just feel that, you know, something like a bedroom, which we used to call as Vishram Kaksh in Hindi, is now being used for uh, digital devices to work with. You are, you know, you're reading. Someone like Iram, I can imagine being lolling on her bed and with a book in her hand. And um, I feel that uh, all these spaces are now open to reinvention. So the way we looked at the same space needs to be looked with uh, a new lens and a new, uh, you know, new eye. And um, I think work from home and domestic leisure and entertainment is something that I would say is a mandate in a new brief of an apartment or a project. 
and um, how well can we imbibe all these things? So um, my real thought is, how do we innovate? Like, like you've been asking us, Komal, what is the innovation in this time? So I ask myself and you know, the others is, how would we rename the same spaces that we have you know, historically imbibed? And uh, maybe they could have names of moods or even sensorial experiences, like you kind of mentioned to me. So I'm really looking forward to working with spaces in a very different essence and thought process. That's, that's very interesting because even at AD during our editorial meetings, we have thought about like, you know, the language that you use to explain interiors and to write about them. Like, you know, is it a sleeping room or is it a bedroom or is it a working room? Like, so, so there is, uh, you know, that kind of conversation going around about how the language needs to change itself. Um, I just have one last question for you and then we'll move on. Um, you know, there's also a lot of conversation around healing and about wellness and, and these good energy and how possibly, you know, architecture can or interiors can, can enable our homes to be more uh, wholesome. Yeah. So um, definitely architecture by its sheer uh, scale of and volume and the infiltration of light proximity to nature, I think uh, itself, it contributes to the wholesomeness of uh, enjoying a space. Uh, with interiors, I think one could adopt a more curatorial approach to design. And uh, it could be something simplistic, but it could be very detail oriented. And I think that itself is an art and, you know, it's a craft in itself. And um, the ability I mean, the other ways of looking at interiors could be the ability to uh, be sensitive to arts and crafts like uh, uh, Iram and Martin so beautifully put together. And um, the choice of materials, I think, is also supremely important. One of the things that I've been noticing is lighting is a very untapped arena. You know, lighting can create the ambiance and the mood. And it has so much potential to contribute to wellness and the wholesomeness of a space. So that is something that I'm looking forward to. And the, I feel that one should always go for quality as opposed to quantity. So that would make the meaning and raison d'etre of life even much more pleasurable. But these are all like, I feel the tangibles. Um, we have something called as the intangible, which I, to me is, you know, the spirit. And um, uh, this is beautiful old adage, which I believe it's called festina liente. And, um, you know, Gaurav, uh, uh, one of your designers, Patrizia Euroclava, said that her grandmother brought, brought her up with this adage. And what it means is um, dress me slowly because I'm in a hurry. So <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, spaces are so in. Uh, we're in a time wherein we want the restative uh, nostalgia in spaces, but I think we need even the stimulative innovation in our spaces and uh, finding this balance is the key to everything. Can That's I say beautiful. something? Sorry. Sorry. I'm just very intrigued by something that Uncle brought up um, because I have a slightly different point of view. I feel that as time has gone by and research has shown us, uh, scientific medical research, spaces for sleep or resting have become very significant and devices are now meant to be kept away. Uh, the amount of time that you spend on a device is to reduce. So, you know, Uncle, you were talking about how the spaces could be adaptable. Should they really be that adaptable or should they not be segregated pockets of spaces that have distinct functions? Um, going back to the notion of slow design, which is sort of equivalent to slow food, the pace that we were living at earlier, are we going to aim to go back to that or are we looking at a slower pace with perhaps greater focus on health, well-being and defined spaces that lend themselves to that? Thank you. Sorry, I just thought it was interesting. And Martha, if you have anything to say to that because you'll be designing those spaces both of you you know i think that i think if we look at society i think i kind of see like this bifurcation happening which is that of the individual family unit 
uh, where I think perhaps conversations on luxury kind of can be very interesting and can be delved into. But it's interesting that the subject of today's discussion is luxury and innovation. And I think where I am imagining uh, a lot of interesting innovation happening is actually in this in the sphere of actually larger societal communications. So for instance, the platform that we're on right now, we're looking at four or five uh, images. I think there's a great deal that architecture has not at all explored. So we're constantly thinking about the physical world, whereas the virtual world is actually going to become more and more of a domain that is going to require not only technology, but actually design and interface. Because I think even after the pandemic, what's going to happen is you realize that, look, you don't need to be flying across the world for every meeting. You don't even need to necessarily go across the city. So there are going to be definite social behavioral shifts, not only as cost savings for companies in the future, but also in terms of time saving. And then, then suddenly this whole new domain basically is going to emerge, which is that, okay, how do we make the experience of meetings different? How do we actually begin to have kind of a sense of collective participation. So for instance, when we, if, if this was happening in Bombay right now, this event, we may have been on a stage and we would have a real sense of an audience. Uh, right now I see five screens in front of me, you know, so which changes a lot in terms of how I begin to interact with everyone here. So perhaps those are sort of interesting innovative frontiers which have to do with technology and virtual space and all where you really start to re figure out new ways of recreating and re reimagining how um, experiences from a pre-COVID world actually start to get uh, transformed into a technologically post-COVID world. So I think both these things of innovation and luxury happen hand in hand because then at the same time within the domestic space, you're creating uh, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of work environments, different kinds of resting environments, but equally in the larger community interaction space, the whole thing starts to shift, you know? Uh, so I think there's some interesting kind of conversations to be had there about what those frontiers are, because uh, I keep also thinking about architecture as I know it, you know, because it's but natural that you kind of keep thinking of brick and mortar, but really there is a whole new world that's going to open up, which is going to require design, which is going to require innovative thinking, and we will be inhabiting it in some way or the other, you know, um, maybe through a screen and maybe as things develop, you know, through sort of devices that we may put on and so on and so forth. So I think that could be interesting as well. I find uh, that uh, the, di the digital revolution is something that we'll all experience. And coming to your uh, thought, Iram, what we're saying is that there are different genres of uh, space design and also the scale of the projects. So it could, it could be that uh, right from an apartment, which requires a lot of elasticity, like we've had in the discussions in our um, other webinars, you know, the fact that um, you probably want to have the flexibility of moving your workspace from, um, you know, from different spaces in your entire project or in your apartment, because you want to experience light somewhere, you want to have a different mood of a, you know, so I feel that um, as time flies, and like Martin said, you know, the way we have visualizing and connecting to devices or to our um, to the way we live uh, would have different experiences I do not um, I do not patronize spending a lot of time on social media you know the idea is not about spending time on social media or uh, a device to um, work for during your sleep hours but the idea is that how can um, technology integrate in your spaces and create a different uh, experience. I mean, th those are also ideas that are uh, in the mm -hmm. offing. So I feel that, um, you know, that is a chat that you and I can have uh, off the cuff. I think Komal's going to uh, want to. Yes. And Gaurav <laughs> would like to speak. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just want to add to that a bit that, you know, no matter what people design and what as designers you put out there, users have a sense of freedom in how they use it. Like, you know, the final onus actually rests on me, whether I want to put my phone on silent and just go away. Like, I just, I think that that kind of individual freedom has a role. Um, anyway, we're kind of, you know, running away with time. I want to next go to Gaurav. And um, Gaurav, you know, so far we've been talking about uh, from the point of view of, of the user or even how we experience spaces. But tell us a little about um, 
from from the perspective of of a creator or a designer or, or even a manufacturer what has the conversation been like at xor like are there you know what are the discussions uh, centered around any any specific developments or trends first of all thanks for having me and hearing such lovely views i wouldn't mind being silent and hearing more of them but uh, i think it's these views that help shape a brand's perspective so it's very important that we look at what they are saying all the stakeholders involved as well as the consumer behavior so a little bit on consumer behavior from our side and that's how we are thinking uh, i also look at myself as a consumer and a year back if you would have asked me a little bit about luxury it would have been a lot more external you know a luxury holiday a luxury artifact or something like that but let's say 3 months into covid you know just hanging out with friends and having drinks or coffee was a luxurious thing that i was missing out so it became a little bit more closer towards people and then i would say at this point of time honestly just having a healthy body is a luxury that i would love to have so it became a little bit closer towards our own body so for us as axor you know the intimacy that you share with your own body is very important and if you really see the bathroom is the most personal space that you have and that's where we kind of work on your personalization whether it's with you know as you mentioned about a designer that we have we have 12 collections from multiple designers that need to feed your intimacy with your body whether it's an extension of a design form that you want whether it's personalization uh, i think some of the panelists mentioned about the emotional connect so we bring out products where you can actually change the faucet head every day so it's like a stage so if you're feeling something different you can actually put a different product on the faucet it's an x or my edition uh, line that i'm talking about but for us it's about facilitating how you interact with yourself because there is nothing better than actually having an experience of water on the human skin and that's what for example axor and our showering is all about uh that's that's quite interesting and also because you know we've touched upon technology before this as well do you want to talk a little more about uh i got a i got a sense that there is a there is an attempt to sort of humanize technology at axor is is that something that you believe in it's a great great point you know within our space everybody talks about sensor faucets as an immediate fallout of let's say covid and we completely understand that but innovation and technology can go in various spheres and for us the delivery of water on the skin is actually what we work on and that's something that's very very special to us so if you look at it you know the way a body experiences water is is very healthy for the body and our products work on that as one of our innovations the kind of spray modes that we have i mean we have have an exquisite product called an axor shower heaven which is all about experience but even within that you have multiple spray modes so you may have for example a soft spray mode which is called rain fit rain infinity or rain tunes we have multiple products that go uh, in that mode and that's about water encompassing the body like an envelope and and that rain spray is the kind of spray that the body feels best about you will be surprised that even the sound of that spray is actually more soothing than a general shower and of course if you need an invigoration or if you need like a a spray mode to wash off let's say shampoo from the hair then you have those spray modes as well but for us technology is about making sure how your body connects with water and an overall healthy experience that you get out of it of course we continue to work on digital interfaces and so many other things but ultimately it's all about how you feel under a shower that really makes you feel good so that's what we are focused on Thank you. Thanks so much. Um I how are we doing on time? Okay, so I want to quickly uh, open the session to audiences. So if anybody has any burning questions, now will be your time. I have one actually right here. I'll I'll read it out and you know whoever feels that it speaks to them please please feel free to answer. Uh this is Gurji Chabra and he's asking does luxury necessarily have to be materialistic or how can we utilize it to break monotony? I think there are two questions in there does does luxury necessarily have to be materialistic? I I feel like we've answered that in a way but if yeah. anybody Uh, but we spoke about the fact all of us said that luxury is also time and right. i think that's hardly materialistic it's not about the value of time so much as what that, that time means to you 
and what you do in that time. So it's not all materialistic. We also right. spoke about how luxury has evolved from being a purely commercial exercise or the understanding of the term. It was never that. But the understanding of luxury is no longer purely commercial, but far more meaningful and understood across a diaspora of emotions, I would believe. Cool. Um, I think we can quickly take one more question. Uh, one second. Uh, all right, this one's interesting. Uh, what's the most innovative idea you've seen in interior design or architecture specifically in the last six months? So, uh, to me, I think, um, uh, I, like Martin was saying, um, I remember the architects Nendo were mentioning of a project that they are working on designing a virtual uh, retail space, and that seems to be a direction that they're taking. One's not seen the realization of it completely, to be honest, but the entire uh, genre of thinking was technological advancement in um, in terms of the digital realm. Yes, there were questions mm -hmm. attached to the sensorial experience of touch, smell, and the, of the object. For instance, if you were shopping a luxury item like a handbag, for instance, which was what they were uh, attempting to design for. But um, I think given the, uh, para the parameters of the current scenario, uh, what was the best way ahead was something that they were aiming to uh, generate and bring out to the audience. Can I just talk about what I loved? I don't know if you guys have seen it. Shikaru Ban did this beautiful uh, bathroom. It's a public bathroom, which is completely transparent glass because he wanted people to feel that it was clean, that they could look at it from outside with this great uh, desire for hygiene and, you know, uh, and then when you walked in, of course, the glass turned opaque. But the idea was that you could enter a space feeling completely secure. And these are public bathrooms that have just been designed in Tokyo. Sweet. I thought that was a great innovation. Yeah. I should <clears throat> look that up. Uh, we are almost towards the end. Uh, we've gone a little bit over. In fact, I want to thank you all personally and from AD to take the time and come and speak to us. And uh, for the audience out there, I hope this was worth your while. And um, thank you for spending your weekend with us. Thank you so much, Komal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Martin. Right. Lovely to see you all.